Welcome. Uh, this is our fifth reading from CFW Walther's The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel. Um, this is going to be part two of the third lecture, and let us get right into it. And again, this can be found at Amazon for only $13 at cost. Only $13. 450 pages. Um, Just and Sinner Publications puts this out. Um, uh, and you can email them at justinsinner at yahoo.com. Or you can check out James, or Jordan Cooper, sorry's uh, YouTube page. Or website, uh, J or Jordan Cooper, Lutheran pastor, theologian. Uh, they put this out at cost, I'm pretty sure. $13 for a 450 page book at cost so people can have it in their hands. And Jordan Cooper is excellent. If, check out his stuff on, on YouTube, introductory stuff to Lutheranism um, and justification and things like that and some deeper stuff and conference stuff. Excellent guy. I love Jordan Cooper. But in the explanation, I'm going to put a copy of an, uh, or a link, sorry, to an online copy of this work so you can follow along as usual. So I'm going to drink my coffee here while we go along. Uh, this is uh, part two of the third lecture. Accordingly, when preparing to preach, the, now this is important. Accordingly, when preparing to preach, the preacher must draw up a strategical plan in order to win his hearers for the kingdom of God. Otherwise, the hearers may say of his sermon, Oh, that was nice, but that will be all. They will leave the church with an empty heart. Um, quote, If anyone were well versed in this art, I mean, whoever so could properly make this distinction, long gospel, he would deserve to be called a doctor of theology. PhD in theology, that's from Martin Luther. And we're going to keep quoting Luther, it looks like. For the law and the gospel must be kept apart from one another. The law is to terrify men and to make them shy and despairing, especially rude and vulgar people, until they learn that they cannot do what the law demands nor achieve God's favor. Let me get more comfortable here on my back. That will make, that will make them despair of themselves, for they can never accomplish the same, uh, obtaining God's favor by their efforts to keep the law. Dr. Stopitz... German name, I remember said to me on a certain occasion, I have more than a thousand times lied to God, that I would become godly, and never did what I promised. Now I shall never again make up my mind to become godly, for I see that I cannot carry out my resolution. I shall never lie to God any more. That was also my experience under the papacy. I was very anxious to become godly, but how long did it last? Only until I had finished reading Mass. An hour later, I was more evil than before. This state of affairs goes on until a person is quite weary and is forced to say, I shall put away from me being godly according to Moses and the law. I shall follow another preacher who says to me, Come to me if you are weary. I will refresh you. Let this word come to me sound pleasant to you. This preacher does not teach that you can love God or how you must act and live, but he tells you how you must but he tells you how you must become godly and be saved spite of the fact that you cannot do as you should. That preaching is wholly different from the teaching of the law of Moses, which is concerned only with works. The law says thou shalt not sin. Go ahead and be godly. Do this, do that. But Christ says, Thou art not godly, and I have been godly in thy place. Let me, re let me repeat that. But Christ says, Thou art not godly, but I have been godly in thy place. Take for me what I give thee. Thy sins are forgiven thee. These two ser sermons must be preached and urged upon men at the same time. 
It is not right for you to stick to one, do one doctrine only, for it is only the law that makes men thirsty, and it does only... It does this only to terrify men's hearts, but it is the gospel alone that satisfies men, makes them cheerful, revives them, and comforts their conscience, consciences. Now, lest the preaching of the gospel only produces lazy, frigid Christians who imagine that they need not do good works, the law says to the old Adam, Say not be godly, shun this, do this, etc. But when... The conscience feels these smitings and realizes that the law is not a mere cipher. Men become terror-stricken. Then you must hear the teaching of the gospel because you have sinned. This is for the the Christian as well. This is our this is Christian application in their lives, not just theology. Then hear then hear the teacher Christ who says to you, "Come, I will not let you die of thirst. I will give you drink." If these facts have been preached to me. Dr. Luther, when I was young, I should have spared my bodily, my body considerably and should not have become a monk. Luther, all the things he did as a monk to his body, it wasn't good. I mean, he had health problems later on. Um, he was doing this to gain the favor of God. But now that these truths are preached, the people of the, this godless world despise them, for they have not adored the sweet bath though which I and others ha have had to pass under the papacy. Not having felt the agony of conscience, they despise the gospel. They have never thirsted. Therefore they, they, all, start, they all start all manner of sex and fanatical doings. It is a true saying, He who does not remember sweet things, who has not tasted bitter things, he who has never been a thirst has no taste. Thirst is a good holster, and hunger is a good cook. But where there is no thirst, even the best drink is relinquished. The doctrine of the law then was given for the for this purpose, that a person has been given a sweat bath of anguish and sorrow under teaching of law. Otherwise men become sated and seraphiated and lose all relish of the gospel if you meet with such people pass them by we are not preaching to them this preaching is for the thirsty to them the message is brought let them come to me and I will give them drink and refresh them in the manner here sketched by Luther the law and gospel must be proclaimed without mingling with one another now and you could check out I'm not sure if this is from Luther's uh, sermon on the law and gospel um, but let me see I have it up here in my PDFs Luther did a sermon in 1532 I believe anyway just type in um, Martin Luther Sermon, Law, Gospel. Martin Luther's Sermon on the Distinction Between Law and Gospel. I think it was 1532. It's only a 12-page um, sermon, but excellent, excellent stuff. I'm not sure if this was taken from there or not. The Distinction Between the Law and the Gospel. A sermon by Martin Luther, January 1st, 1532. And I should read from that uh, one of these days. A preacher who is not simple in his preaching preaches not Christ, but himself. And if anyone preaching... Preaching himself preaches people into perdition, even when they say of his preaching, Ah, but that was beautiful. That man is an orator. Even a true, honest preacher is visited by thoughts of vanity that spring from his sinful flesh. But as soon as he notices this, he casts these, accursed, these cursed thoughts of vanity from him and cries to God to rid him of them. He enters his pulpit, a humble man, 
people can hear whether preaching comes from the heart or not. Of course, you cannot speak like Luther. Still, you must resolve in your mind this problem. How can I preach the law to secure and the gospel to crush sinners? Every sermon must contain both doctrines. No, 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 let me read this again. Oh, sorry. How can I preach the law to, sec to the secure and the gospel to crush sinners? Two different audiences. Every sermon must contain both doctrines. When either is missing, the other is wrong. For any sermon is wrong that does not present all that is necessary to a person's salvation. You must not think that you have rightly divided the word of truth if you preach the law in one part of your sermon and the gospel in the other. Not a topographical division of this kind is worthless. No, a topographical division of this kind is worthless. Both doctrines may be contained in one sentence, but in your audience, every one must get the impression. This is meant for me. Even for the most comforting and cheering sermon, even the most comforting and cheering sermon must contain also the law. Let me cite you a passage from Luther's ex exposition of Psalm 23, verse 3. He restores my soul, Luther says, inasmuch as the Lord our God has a twofold word, the law and the gospel. The prophet by these words, he restoreth my soul, indicates with sufficient clearness that he is not speaking of the law, but of the gospel. When you meet with statements in your Bible, that's Luther's done now, that's end quote, but when you meet with statements in your Bible containing threats of punishment, classify them as law. Words that comfort, words that speak of given, offering something belong to the gospel. You will not find a gospel periscope from which you could not preach both the law and and gospel. Luther proceeds. Let me get another drink of coffee here, guys. Luther proceeds. The law cannot restore the soul, for it is a word that makes demand upon us and commands us to love God with all our heart, etc., and our neighbor as ourselves. The law condemns every person who fails to do this and pronounces this sentence upon him. Cursed is everyone that doeth not all that is written in the book of the law. Now it is certain that no man on earth is doing this. Therefore, in due time, the law approaches the sinner, filling his soul with sadness and fear. If no, re if no res respite is provided from its smiting, it continues its onslaught, forcing the sinner into despair and eternal damnation. Therefore, St. Paul says, by the law is only the knowledge of sin. And again, the law worketh nothing but wrath. The gospel, however, is a blessed word. It makes no demands on us, but only for us poor sinners, makes no demands on us, but only proclaims glad tidings, namely that God has given his only son for us poor sinners to be our shepherd to seek us famished and scattered sheep, to give his life for our redemption from sin and everlasting death, and the power over the devil. The question might here be raised, why is it that the law leads men into, into horrible sin of despair? That is merely an accidental, accidental feature of its operation. In and by itself, the law too is good. Let me follow this up with a passage from Luther's commentary on Galatians. G greatest commentary ever written on Galatians. Galatians 2, verse 3 and 4, Luther says, Accordingly, when your conscience is terrified by the law, and you are wrestling with God, the judge, do not consult your, your reason or the law, But take your stand alone in the grace of God and his word of consolation. Cling to it, to this and the act, and act as if you have never heard a word of law. Enter 
into that darkness, Exodus 20, 21, whether, where neither the law nor human reason gives its light, but only the dark word of faith. The believer relies with a certainty on being saved in Christ, without law and regardless of it. Thus the gospel without without and regardless of the light of the law and re, and reason leads us into darkness into the darkness of faith where the law and reason exercise no authority we must indeed hear the law also yet in its proper place at the proper time when he had come down from the mountain he is a legislator and governs the people with the law in this manner our conscience is to be exempt from the law, but ours is to obey the law. Hence, any person who understands well how to distinguish the law, the gospel from the law, may thank God and know that he is a theologian.